There have been a lot of Holy Trinity comparison videos out there, but nobody can give you quite the perspective that I can because I put a freaking crap ton of miles on these vehicles. I'm gonna go over some really cool facts about these cars, some of which you absolutely will not know, give you a little bit of history on why I bought them, and surprisingly, uh, one of them that may go in the near future or may not, I don't know, stay tuned, you'll find out. I bought the P1 a little bit over a year ago. This was heavily influenced by Tommy, just candidly. I ended up actually doing quite a bit of shopping, had a silver one, had an orange one lined up. I even was bidding on Dead Mouse's blue P1 that went through at the Las Vegas auction and was only $25,000 shy of owning that one to match the Senna that I've got somewhere or another. Bought this from Miller Motor Cars, got it, and uh, I must say that it is a pretty fun car. Now, outside of Tommy's influence, I think the main reason I bought this was because it is everybody's favorite car. It is Manny Koshman's favorite car of his collection. It was Triple F's favorite car of the collection. I can't remember who else, but I feel like three other big collectors have said the P1 is their favorite car. It's not quite my favorite car, and I don't fully understand why they all believe that to be the case, but, um, but I assumed I would get the absolute best experience out of the Holy Trinity from this car right here. Next up is the 918. This is the second car of the Holy Trinity that I bought. I got it right around November of last year. When I first got it, my first impression was actually not good. I went and took this thing out and I was actually totally underwhelmed from this car. I told Tommy that I had some slight regret about it. And, uh, and the reason why I actually bought this car was because Rick, who is a member of Iron Gate, the community where I store my cars, he mentioned that uh, he's got a bunch of hypercars and he mentioned that the 918 was probably the next logical choice to get. Um, so. Needless to say, I was a little bit disappointed when I got it, but when that weather started warming up, come like March or April, I took this thing out and I really started beating it up, and it is now my favorite car in the entire freaking collection. So what a difference it can make if you're just a little bit patient about a car and give it a little bit of a chance. Kind of like with Tommy, but he's not there yet. <laughs> I'm just kidding. And finally, I picked up the LaFerrari, which was actually a very recent edition and the last one of the Holy Trinity that I got. Uh, something that was hindering me was that this is the most expensive, almost twice the cost of any of these other two. Actually, it is. It's basically more than both of these added together or right around that same price. Um, so that was the biggest hindrance. And I told my crew that there was no way I was paying over $3 million for one of these. So then I found one. Um, compliments of Perrin at Chicago Motor Cars. He got me this one right at $3 million. I'll just say it, that's what I paid for it. And, uh, and it is a really, really awesome sounding and raw and really, really fun car. So I'm gonna call this one number two, Porsche 918 number one, and the McLaren P1 number three. Rapid fire favorite and least favorite things. My favorite thing about this 918 is the combination of the acceleration and the sound. It is top notch and I think nothing beats it in the entire collection. My least favorite thing about the 918 is going to be getting out of it because it may be the most difficult car to get out of for an old guy like me. My favorite thing about the LaFerrari is the sound. It has an amazing sounding exhaust. My least favorite is that this is quite a squirrely car. It is, it is one of the most squirrely cars when you hit it hard on the acceleration of the entire collection. My favorite thing about the P1, and I hate to sound redundant here, uh, clearly this is a theme that I like the way cars sound, and these three are no exception, but it is the combination of the exhaust and the acceleration, once again, like the 918. It really is, Natalia, I'm sorry. Deal with it. Uh, <laughs> and she got nothing. My least favorite thing about this, and the list is pretty decent, but I'm gonna go with the seat because it is really small, tight. I don't know how Tommy fits in it with them childbearing hips of his, but I definitely, it's an adjustment to get into it. And it's a little bit squirrely, I had to say that too. And now I'm gonna go take a drive in each one and we're gonna get into the fun stuff. And again, this is stuff that only someone that actually freaking drives these things would know. Thank you. Ow. Let's start with comfort. First off, my hips are squeezed into this seat. Other than that, the seat's actually pretty plush and comfortable, surprisingly, compared to the Senna. The Senna's like sitting on boards. In race mode, which it is now, the suspension is not forgiving at all. You feel every bump. I hit a pothole in Chicago and thought I broke this vehicle in half. Uh, so if you're gonna drive it daily, it needs to be in just the, the simplest uh, suspension mode um, and definitely not race mode. Overall, this car, after driving it for a little while, it's really not that bad. I don't, I don't feel that uncomfortable because the seat's padded well enough and I don't typically drive it in race mode, even though it looks so much better. Overall, daily drivability is actually pretty good. It is a good car to daily drive. It's not extremely difficult to get out of, but reliability is kind of what comes into play and makes it less exciting of a daily driver because it is so unreliable. And I hate to, to crap on McLaren, but it seems to be just a thing with all McLarens. Uh, this one has a lot of problems. It's actually scheduled to go in for a service in like a week. The battery is bad. I've got the new Speedtail battery in order that cost 150 something thousand dollars. 
that'll get installed next year, but the hybrid drive system's bad, there are leaks. Um, there are problems everywhere, and when I bought this just a little over a year ago, it was fully inspected and had a clean bill of health, so. Sorry, I had to do a quick pull. And you know, I almost hate to say this, but every time I get back in this car, and I haven't driven this in, in a few weeks, but it actually is really fun to drive. Why do I knock it so much? I don't know. Back to the reliability. I think I've probably got $300,000 worth of repairs to get this thing running top-notch when one year ago it was clean bill of health. So that's McLaren for you folks. Am I going to buy the replacement for the P1? You're damn right I am. User interface, I've been a strong advocate for McLaren. Really, really like McLaren's touchscreen. It's simple, easy to use, very responsive. So I give, I give them a solid uh, 9 out of 10 for user interface and usability there. And then the exhaust, of course, uh, the P1, definitely in the top 25th percentile of exhaust notes. It just sounds great. We have a Valvetronic exhaust system that they are shipping us, and I'm going to install it myself. And this thing's supposed to shoot fire and sound incredible because it's basically a straight pipe. So not many people out there that tune their hypers, but at the Hamilton Collection, that is what we do, folks. Kind of hitting on the overall performance. The acceleration is top notch. We just did a drag race video that shocked me at how close um, my all my hypers are, actually. Um, you should go watch it, but there is a 0.4 second delta between the fastest and the slowest hyper car on the quarter mile. That is it, four tenths of a second. Unbelievable, I was super surprised by that. I'd say the, bra the braking is kind of mid. Braking is, is decent, it's definitely not bad, it's definitely not a Bugatti, but the braking does well. And then the handling is, is where this thing shines. I mean, I can turn, swerve, really, really, really is one with the road, and, uh, and McLaren has done well with that portion. Tie all those things back together, and then you get down to value. I paid right about $1.6 million for this car. It is still holding its value. I think they actually have gone up a little bit since then. Um, I wanna say that they're going, they're going 1.7, 1.8 plus right now. Just value from an investment perspective, it is there. You know, is this car worth that much if it wasn't part of the Holy Trinity? I would say probably not. And this is actually the car that if it wasn't part of the Holy Trinity, I'm probably selling it to be completely honest. But if I sold this, then I no longer have the Holy Trinity. And for whatever reason, that's important to me. So the McLaren is more than likely gonna stay as part of the collection. Again, why don't I drive this more often? We should do this in the same order as the P1, so we're gonna cover comfort first. Very comfortable car. These seats are are leather, are soft, fit my, my big body real nicely. It's kind of funky that it has adjustable pedals, so you can't move this seat forward, backwards. You can't tilt it, no lumbar adjustment, none of that. Oh, and then it swaps into E-mode. I don't like that feature, I have to hit a button. You can't pick when it goes in E-mode. It picks for you, and it's usually at the most inopportune time. Maybe that's my least favorite thing about this. That and that it's squirrely. But really comfortable car. Um, feels good on the road. Not nearly as rough and aggressive as the P1 when it comes to the suspension. Uh, daily drivability, absolutely a car that I've driven a bunch since I got it. I think I've put nearly a thousand miles on this in maybe three months, and that was with the month of it in the shop. Great car, great drivability. Um, comfortable, not too difficult to get in and out of. So thumbs up there for La Ferrari. I would daily drive this all year long if it wasn't so squirrely in the winter. That's not gonna stop me from driving in the winter though. I will drive it in the snow and maybe we'll go do some more uh, snowboarding like we did with the Bugatti, why not? Reliability, so when I bought this thing, I was able to get a pretty good deal on it because it had an, a leak on one of the oil seals. The seller said that they would take care of that leak, so that's fine, I was willing to wait that month to get a really good deal on this thing, um, and that I did. My 488, I didn't have a lot of luck with on in terms of reliability, that thing was shooting out smoke, shooting out oil, and that problem was fixed, but uh, but at the end of the day, reliability is important, and I think that Ferrari has a pretty good reputation. They've been around for a long time. Um, so overall, I trust this engine, and I actually bought the, the warranty they offer for the low $30,000 range, which sounds expensive, but when you're talking about a three plus million dollar car, that's one of the most affordable warranties by far um, in the industry. Bugatti just released a four-year warranty that includes maintenance, and it's over $200,000. So 
Um, so I've got a peace of mind for two years on this for the low $30,000 range um, where reliability becomes less of a factor, um, but overall has good reliability anyway. User interface, not a huge fan of Ferrari. They put their little screen to the right of the steering wheel. I actually don't like how they put blinkers on the steering wheel either. Um, that kind of drives me crazy. Part of the reason I got rid of the plaid, um, to be cl completely honest with you, but their their whole user interface is kind of a pain in the ass and it's it's definitely one of the one of the worst. And their sound systems suck too. We were sitting in the new Pagani Utopia. That is the best sounding sound system that I have heard in any car in my entire life. Uh, so I'm excited to finally have a hypercar with a good sound system when that comes out in 2025. The exhaust on this may be the best sounding just like startup, cold start and rev exhaust of the, of the collection. <laughs> If we did do a straight pipe on it, I wouldn't admit it because I didn't wouldn't want to get sued from Ferrari. But uh, but I've heard some firsthand with a straight pipe exhaust. You know what I'm saying? And it sounds pretty amazing. <laughs> Woo! That was squirrely. Wow. Uh, when we did that YouTube video of the drag race, we actually made sure all the tires were nice and warm and sticky, so it was a very fair comparison. Woo, woo, woo. Very good handling. Amazing. Let's say that we did a straight pipe system, you know, hypothetically, you know what I'm saying? I would say that we probably should go do a, a better, louder system somehow, some way, because this thing is being underutilized on the sound department. Overall performance, we're talking acceleration, braking, handling. Um, again, from the drag race, we learned what really was the fastest. I feel like this was the one that was rated the fastest of the three, um, but I think in our Drag Race video it did the worst of the Holy Trinity, and so a little disappointed there given that it's 2x the cost of any one of the other cars. Um, still really fast, again still a really small delta between the three vehicles, but um, so again it's really fast, I just thought it'd be a teeny tiny baby girl a bit faster, and I'm okay with that. But the braking is good on this. I would just call it a solid good. The handling is really nice. One of the first things you notice is that it's just very forgiving as long as it's not spinning out and just grips the road really well. I think I'm freaking people out on the road. They're like, what's this guy doing? He drinking? Uh, the answer to that question is yes. I've only had about a six pack today. Fun fact about me is that I've never had alcohol in my entire life. Can you imagine? True story. And you tie all that back together and then we start talking about value. Value is kind of twofold. Is that car gonna be worth this amount of money in the future? And I genuinely do think that this vehicle is gonna be worth what I paid, if not significantly more. And then is it worth paying $3 million for the experience that this provides? That's where it gets a little bit more hazy. So it's a little bit about you know styling, performance, sentiment, art, you name it. And I would say that could I have better spent $3 million? Maybe. But would I go back and have not made this purchase? No. I got such a good deal on it and it is such a fun car that I would go back that same day and make that same purchase. Overall, pretty comfortable car. I'm gonna put this kind of in the middle of the range. It is hard to get out of, yes, like I said, but the seats are pretty plush and comfortable. They don't uh, tilt back or f or they don't lean back or forward. Overall, they're comfortable. I don't mind driving this thing an hour. It's not gonna kill me. Comfort, thumbs up, just enough. Daily drivability, absolutely. It is so lightweight, agile. It sounds so amazing. It's just so fun to drive. I, I don't even know how else to explain it other than this is such a fun, badass car. And uh, and if I'm gonna spend a million bucks, I'm gonna get a McLaren Senna. If I'm gonna spend two million, uh, I'm gonna get a Porsche 918. If I'm gonna spend three million, a Bugatti Chiron. Not the LaFerrari, sorry. Uh, so, best car. If you, if you got two million bucks to spend, you have to get one car. 918, in my opinion, hands down, best car that you can buy for that value. One thing about Porsche is they build a really, really reliable car. I have beat the living shit out of my GT3 RS, and the worst that has happened to that is that it got a little bit of a loose exhaust clip on it. That was because I put a Dundon crack pipe exhaust on it, so you put the factory exhaust back on that, and I've probably had zero major issues. With this one, I did have to replace the hybrid drive battery, which is a $65,000 repair, um, but I guess this car had a history, a little bit of issues with the system and the battery, so they did it for 5,000 bucks for me. I got a brand new battery, the last one that exists in the US uh, for 5,000 bucks. 
It seems to me that the hybrid drive systems from the, the 2010 to 20s in all three of the Holy Trinity seem to be highly unreliable, um, the, both the battery and the systems themselves. So uh, you take that out of the element and this is probably the most reliable of all of the vehicles. User interface, the Porsche is very similar to the McLaren. I would say it's a little, a little less good. I'd call it a seven or an eight out of 10 where the, the LaFerrari was the worst user interface by far. This keeps up with the McLaren, but not quite as much. But I can figure it out, it's easy to use. There's a little bit of funky German stuff with how it operates. The exhaust and the acceleration. Like, that's just so fun and so badass. I think it helps that the exhaust ports out like a foot behind my head. Um, it's the only car that I have that has the exhaust exit literally super high up above the actual engine of the car. So you can really just feel that rumble, you can hear it really well. And I am very excited when I hit the gas. And then that gets you down to overall performance, my acceleration, my braking, my handling. Braking again, kind of middle of the way. I'm pretty sure the Bugatti has just ruined me on braking because the Bugatti is so amazing on braking. There's nothing that comes close to it. I've said it time and time again, and I have yet to find a car that can even come close. Handling amazing car. Uh, something I've noticed, I guess, uh, comparing the Holy Trinity today is that all three of them have exceptional handling. Congratulations, McLaren, Ferrari, and Porsche for creating three machines that handle superbly. Um, and all three of them have kept up their own on the track. I know this because not only do I daily them, but I've also taken all of them to the track before. And then acceleration, of course, this was the fastest production car, I believe, from 2014 to 2019, maybe when the Ferrari SF90 dethroned it, and then the Plaid dethroned that. So it's clearly a fast car, and of the Holy Trinity, it was the fastest on the drag strip when we did our comparison. So if you wanna go watch that video, it's pretty fun. Um, we compared all my Hypers, and then we raced them against my GTR that, that got back not too long ago. And maybe I should modify the exhaust on this thing, just thinking back to the, the exhaust amazingness, but um, acceleration amazing, handling amazing, and then uh, braking again, kind of middle of the road. And once again, that leads you to value. Um, just the pure fun this gives me from, from the sound, the feel, the acceleration, and because resale wise it's still holding its own, I think that this is probably, to me, is the car that has the most value of all of them. This and the P1 were the cheapest of the Holy Trinity. I just get so much more enjoyment out of this. You know, let's say all three of these cars were worth the same money. They're all three at $1.6 million. What am I gonna buy? I'm gonna buy this 918, hands down. So fun. There ain't nothing out there like that. And there you have it, folks. 918 is still the reigning champion and my favorite car of the collection. Would I ever parse up or split up this Holy Trinity? Yes, but only under one condition, and that is that I get another car that replaces that. So if I'm gonna sell the P1, I'm gonna go get another P1. I was just looking at a blue one with orange calipers. Actually, it was the very same one that I passed and missed out on that last auction. So I'm actually considering even swapping that for that. So won't break it up may swap one for another like one if it's a better or cooler color. As always, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Let us know which one is your favorite and hit that notification button so that you know right when our videos come out. Thank you.